you at 27 decide, yeah, I'm good, I got everything I wanted out of this, now I have other things I want to focus on. Yeah. It's crazy to me. Do you ever look back and think, man, if I'd just given it a few more years, do you ever think that? You know, like, I think, I think right when I retired, it was really hard to grasp, like, that I used to always say, like, oh, my identity is not sport. My, my identity is in Christ, or like, I live for God, and like, this is what I do. And then I retired, and I was like, oh, shoot, my identity is in <laughs> I was wrong. <laughs> like, wait, I was lying. Violation. Oh, you thought I was done? Oh, my God. No. Oh, my God. Gotta face it, I'm the one. Check, what the check, huh? Give me my respect, my respect, my respect, huh? Medals on my neck, on my neck, on my neck, huh? Tell them I'm the best, I'm the best, I'm the best. What they talking about? Okay, everybody, welcome to another edition of Kicking It. Uh, we are here today with Lauren Holiday, two time Olympic gold medalist, World Cup winner. Hall of Famer, the person who hooked me up with very dope seats at my very first Angel City game. So it is good to have you with us. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. You've always been on our list, actually, like since we were brainstorming when we started the show of who we wanted to have and who we thought had an interesting story to tell, not just in football, but outside of football too. You were like right up there on, on our list. So we're, we're grateful that this is happening. Thank you, thank yes. you. Um, I guess, how, how's life treating you? You good in life? Yeah, life is good. Yes. Uh, big move. We moved from Milwaukee to Boston, so still adjusting. Um, kids are resilient, so my kids, I think, have adjusted the most. Obviously, my husband plays, so he's had to adjust quickly. Plays uh, for the Boston Celtics, Drew Holiday. Yeah, plays yeah. for the Celtics. H how did you guys meet? Uh, we met in college, so we both went to UCLA. I was actually a little bit older than him and so I was I was getting ready to leave school uh -huh. um, he got drafted after his freshman year so we we started dating once we both left uh, mm -hmm. UCLA obviously that's a connection right that you guys have right there but just in terms of like getting to know each other where it all started what what was his dating game like how did he ask you out what was the first approach like was it smooth was it awkward I tried to break up with him quite a few times you did. Um, <laughs> He never, he never quite let me do that. Uh -huh. When he officially like asked me out, he or to be like his girlfriend, he was like, you know, what do I have to do to, you know, be with you? And I said, well, I don't want to make you a priority. So that was my wow. response. Oh. <laughs> okay. And um, then he just kept showing up. So he never, he God that didn't him. scare him. He didn't run away. Uh -huh. Persistence. Um, that's how. That's how you amen. get in there. Yes. I love that. And so he, he kept coming back. And um, he was in Philly. He got drafted to Philly. I got drafted to Boston. And so he would come like every two weeks. He would come and, and see me. Um, you think his version would be the same? Like it, from his perspective? I think it would. <laughs> I think it would. And, and that was because you were just like, I'm in a, in a point where I'm focused on me, my career, what it is I want to achieve. And that comes first. Yeah, I was like, I want to be the best player in the world. I want to win an Olympics. I want to win a World Cup. But like, it wasn't good enough to just win. I wanted to start. I wanted to be impactful. I wanted to, to like make my mark on the game. And I also knew that he had a lot of demands on him to want to be the best player that he could be. So in my mind, I was like, we don't need to be each other's priority. Mm. Um, and then it just kind of happened that way that we were each other's support system. I guess I always wonder how that works to such high profile and such successful athletes. Cause like if I, like me personally, I think I'm better than, than my partner at ping pong and <laughs> I let him know that I think I'm the best at ping pong. So like if, for you guys, how does that work? Does that competitiveness, does it come out? Do you drive each other? Do you diss each other? Like how does it work? Um, one time I cursed at him when we were playing um, <laughs> spades uh -huh. and that didn't go so well. He's like, you're, you're, you're cursing at me? You're name calling? Like, what is wrong with you? And I was like, I want to win. Um, I have the switch. This yeah. is just in me. Uh, so I think I'm slightly more competitive between us mm -hmm. with, in, within the race relationship. I think he's like happy wife, happy life. So okay. if you win, I win. I think he takes that mindset uh -huh. a little bit more. Um, but there was a time we played Uno. It was just him and I, and he's, 
I was like whooping his butt and we were supposed to go like, Philly had just opened a Shake Shack <laughs> and we were gonna go try Shake Shack. And uh, he was like, no, I'm not hungry because I was winning. And then he started beating me and then he was like, man, I'm so hungry, but I had already eaten pizza that was in the fridge. So that was like one of our like memorable fights. Arguments? Yeah. <laughs> I, I think it's so, so dope that he, whenever he's asked about you in, in the media, he's always like, she was the better athlete in the house. Yeah. He always reps you. Before he's rocking the, your US number on the US men's national team kit, but it was intentionally for you to represent you. Uh, when you see that, like, what does that mean to you? When you hear it, when you see it, like he's always so proud to be your, your husband. Yeah, it means a lot to me. And you know, like I think just, you guys know in relationships, like love carries you a long way, but like being each other's best friend and supporter, it takes you so much further and deeper in your relationship. And it's not an act, he really does feel that way. Um, he tells our kids, I love y'all so much, but I love your mom more. And so now my daughter tells us, I love you guys so much, but I love my brother more. <laughs> and, and it's just, he really does like, he puts that in our house. We love each other, but like, mommy and daddy put each other first. And um, I feel like I chose right. Mm. I did a good job. <laughs> That's very, how long have you guys been married? We're going on our 11th year. So okay. this year is 11. You guys have been together 20 years, which like freaked me out the other day. Cause I, th yeah. that's my. You've been married 20 years? No, but this fall will be, we would have been to <clears throat> together for 20 years. We've been, we've been married since um, July, uh, June 29th of 2012. So it feels like, like when we talk about best friends and, and going through some really difficult experiences together. And I relied on her so much to get me through those things. and. You know, it's just an unbreakable bond and something that I know I can go through anything. I can be on my deathbed and she's gonna be right there next to me and, and I feel the same way for her. So, um, you know, then when you have kids, that kind of shifts a little bit because you're fo so focused on yeah. them. But I ultimately know I have to make sure that I'm always putting her first. Yeah. And like Drew is, like happy wife, happy life. Like yeah. I live by that. I yeah. know that that is the case. I don't know, how, you, how do you feel? I mean, shoot, I've been married for 17 years. Uh, we went to college together and then kind of reconnected around uh, the World Cup time. And um, yeah, I mean, she's been, been huge for me in terms of being able to like prolong my career and watch the kids and allow me times to like take naps and holding down the fort while I miss like first, you know, sometimes first birthdays or first time the kids walk and, and stuff like that. So she's been she's been a warrior for me. Um, and, you know, it just we, we work. But you feel like you picked right because it's kind of like we grew up similar faith based. We both were Catholic and uh, um, we both kind of from rural areas, humble upbringings. And uh, yeah, we, we love our kids, but we ended up having more than I thought for sure. Having six <laughs> kids, man, it's like. <laughs> Stepping on an ant bed and trying to like <laughs> corral everything, but six uh, kids is next level. It's, yeah. uh, That's next but, level. But you know, it's it's you know con controlled chaos, but but we love it. So so now when you look at your relationship, because obviously there was that period in time where you said hey, like, we don't need to be each other's priority. We need to pursue what we're pursuing and somehow find that common ground in between, right? Now do you see your role as I'm here to support him because he's still in that, that phase of pursuing his dreams? Or how do you see that? Yeah, I think that you're never done pursuing your dreams, though. Mm -hmm. And so what I, what I have found is cool is, like, we always put each other first. So like even when I was going through health struggles and they weren't sure what, what it was and before I was diagnosed with a brain tumor, they said MS and I was, I was like, in my mind, loving him meant like, hey, we don't have any kids yet. We're, you know, this is early mm. on. Run while you still can. Like, you don't have to watch me go through this. And he was like, you're crazy. I, I like, I got you no matter what. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel the same way now, like, now that I'm retired, it's the same. How do I make his life easier if he needs a nap, if he needs that? But really, like, how do I champion him? And then he's doing the same for me. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, well, what are you doing next, babe? What do you want to do? Like, I think you can do this. I think you can do that. It never ends. I feel like the roles 
might switch where now I'm at home with kids and I have more of that responsibility, but like my dreaming has never stopped. And so, so he's still like, he still pursues me in that way where he's mm -hmm. like, no, what do you want to do? Like, what makes you happy? What is, and so I think that that's something really cool about our relationship too. So, so what's your new dream? Avocado farm, chilling, I, I slanging avocado avocados. Farm. Um, <laughs> my new dream, so right now I'm working uh, with Avenue Capital, I'm a partner, and I want to buy women's sports teams. Um, I want to be at the top. I feel like there's a lot culturally that needs to change, and I want to create a culture that is is positive for women um, and positive for women's sports because I think that we are as competitive as men's sports. I think we can be as lucrative as men's sports, um, but we haven't had the foundation. Um, and I think that the lack of integrity in women's sports, actually in all sports in general, now like being in the NBA side and being obviously a professional athlete myself, I feel like we don't, we treat athletes as commodities we treat them differently um not like slightly less than human i think kevin durant just said that the other day like when a fan said something crazy to him and it's like how do we create a culture where we actually view them as humans and as as like doers of good and people that can change um not only like the game but change like the community that they're in change the area that they're in and i feel like we can empower athletes to do that um, but there has to be alignment and in integrity. And I think that that's like really my passion. So speaking to that, you said uh, you want to own multiple women's sports teams, essentially, right? That would be the goal. So uh, you, can you define your role with Angel City? I know you were an original investor. Is that, do you have kind of an yeah. additional role to that? No, uh, Angel City, I was an original investor. Angel City, how they're set up and how they, they did things was slightly different. They had so many people invest, you know. They're, I would say that I'm very, um, small okay. investor, I would like to be like in a position where I make decisions and I have the power to to make decisions because of the level of investment. Because we of give the you level that. of investment okay. or uh, where I am, yeah, in that level, the level of equity. Equity and so you want to be a mogul. I want to be a majority owner. Okay. <laughs> so, so if you were a majority owner, what does that mean for the team that you're currently with, or would you stay a small percentage with them and then? Do another team? How, how, how is would that you, acceptable to do like, that? Yeah, I that's what I'm trying to figure out. How would you envision that? that yeah, kind of obviously, move? I would love to be with Angel City. That would be amazing. Okay. Um, really, and and not just like women's soccer. I think women's sports in general. I think like women's volleyball is incredible right now. Women's basketball. Um, they just started the women's hockey league. All of those things are intriguing to me. Um, and even being ownership on the male side too, I think has. Uh, has like piqued my interest because I feel like we've thrown money at the men's side. People, obviously the men have done a great job, um, but it's like there's, there's still a disparity of how, you know, ownership and the athletes see each other. And it's like, how do we bridge that gap? Because- How, What do you mean by that? There's a disparity? Well, ownership groups, they, they, they want to win, right? And athletes want to win, but why? Mm -hmm. Like there's a different why. Why do you want to win? Because of how it makes me feel, and that, you know what I mean, and, and hard just, work pays off. Yeah, is what you've dedicated your life to, right? Yeah. And then like, what, why, I love, what I love to do. Why would you say ownership wants to win? I feel like there's two there's two buckets. One for financial purposes, and the other for, you know, it's 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 nice to brag to say I have the best team. Like we have the rings. So I think it kind of goes hand in hand, but probably for the most part, it's the financial aspect. Even, even as an athlete, I would say that there is an, asp an, a, an aspect of f financial, being able to take care of your family. Because for me, that was a dream. Be, be able to be a kid as long as I could be a kid by playing something that I loved, but also to be able to take care of my family in a better way than my, my family was able to take care of me. Right, and so like ownership and athletes, they actually do have common ground. And it's like, how do we, how do we find that common ground? And then how, that's how you build integrity. It's like, okay, well, yeah, ownership might want to win for a slightly different reason than why the athlete wants to win, but there is common ground there. So like, how do we treat each other then to, and honor each other to be able to, to complete that and to be able to do that? And I think the best organizations in the world have found some sort of version of that 
looking after people in terms of how you trade them. For example, I've known times in MLS, a player, they got pregnant and, and the offseason had their kid and then find out they're being traded to, yeah. to another team. So kind of more stuff like that or Yeah, like that or deeper? just like being honest about where, where they see you. The being honest about, it, it's like the trade aspect is one thing, but also it's like, you know, when you play on a team and, and you're clearly defined, your role is clearly defined, and then they follow through with what they say, it's like that builds trust. And once trust happens, then it's like, okay, well, if you trade me, I know that you're gonna do it in the best way possible. But in Europe, like the thing is, what I liked about how it was set up over there in terms of in the States was you had more of a say. Like, all right, do you wanna go to this team? If not, you're probably not gonna play with us. We might put you on the reserves, but if you chose to, you could still stay at that club, still make that money. You just are not necessarily gonna play. But in the States, unless you have the power to say, I have a no trade clause, right. you don't have control over being shipped, your family, your kids, and, and all that, and, and kind of dealing with that. So in terms of how it's set up in the States, I think it's, it's kind of more difficult on the athletes because of that scenario. Yeah, and I think, I just think that there's a way to do it where you can, you can. Everybody win. Yeah, everybody win, or even if there is hurt involved, or like you said, you have to move your city to, a, or your family to a new city, it's like, there is a way to communicate. And I think there's a way that we can build athletic organizations to be that. The um, investment group that you mentioned, sorry, what did you call it, the investment group you mentioned? Avenue Sports Fund. Avenue Sports Fund. Mm -hmm. So is this right that uh, Steph Curry, uh, Harry Kane, they're also kind of like high profile investors in that fund. So do you think that's what makes a difference in, in terms of what you're saying is finding athletes who understand what it's like to be an athlete to then run the athletic organization. Is that yeah. the difference maker? Yeah, and Candace Parker, Lindsey Vaughn, we're all involved mm -hmm. um, in like when we're going through the process of buying a team or investing in, in something, the you know, then we're, they're asking our opinion. Like, mm. how, do, how does this work? What would this look like? How would you structure this? And it's like, it's not just someone coming in and saying, well, I have all the money and I know best. It's like, oh wait, the, the athlete has actually lived this. How do we do this now? Right. And how do we create an organization based off how Candace Parker sees it or Lindsey Vaughn? And these are all like athletes that were at the top of their game. Um, Michael Strahan. How do how do we how do we recreate or their experience? How do we make it better than what they experience? I know you, you just moved back to Boston. I know you played for the Boston Breakers. Yeah. You're back in Boston. How do you and Drew go about giving and, and changing the community in Boston for the better? Yeah, so Drew and I created in 2020 the Drew and Lauren Holiday Foundation, JLH Fund, um, and we gave away everything that he was gonna make in the bubble, it was like 5.3 million um, to black nonprofits and black owned business. Um, and we've continued to do that since 2020. We give a million dollars away every year. It's not just about giving, it's about showing up. And so how do you create a community when you give? Because it's we say all the time, like, it's super easy to write a check, but what they're doing in the community, that's the hard part. But it's like, well, we want to be a part of their community. And so um, that's what we hope to do in Boston. And when we went to Milwaukee, we added Milwaukee. That's really what made it feel like home, was like giving back to the community and getting to know what was happening in the city and what was happening in their world. Um, and so that's what we hope to do in Boston, too. So to, to kind of talk about your career as well, because obviously um, we've talked a lot about your current life, which is more family based. And you went out on an almighty high. 2015 World Cup, you win in the final, you score a goal. It, it just feels like the ultimate way to leave the game. But you're 27 years old. Do you ever look back and think, man, if I'd just given it a few more years? Right when I retired, it was really hard to grasp like that. I used to always say like, oh, my identity is not sport. Like my, my identity is in Christ or like I live for God and like this is what I do. And then I retired and I was like, oh shoot, my identity is soccer. <laughs> I was wrong. <laughs> like, wait, I was lying. That wasn't true. Uh -huh. Because that was all I had ever known. Right. 
And I think for me, the biggest struggle is like, what the heck else are you good at? Mm -hmm. That's gonna give you the validation, the like, to like feel I, purposeful and valuable. Yeah, right? like I knew I was good when I hit certain, I knew I was good when I was starting. I knew I was good when I made the national team. I mm -hmm. knew I, like there were, there were measurements. Mm -hmm. And then it was like, now I'm a mom. I don't know if I'm a good mom. I hope I am. Right. <laughs> I'm like trying hard to be the best. But there was no level of measurement that uh, I could really like find. Fulfilling. So did you feel lost? Yeah, I still, I feel like still now, and I don't know if you guys feel that way, you, this might be fulfilling all of your dreams. So um, <laughs> I still now feel that, like where I'm like, wait, am I, it's like almost like a questioning of, wait, am I good at this? Or do I belong in this room? Like, I'm not sure if this is like what I'm supposed to be or where I'm supposed to be, where in sport, like I had that confidence within me where outside of sport, that I feel like that's something I'm still learning. Mm. That 2015 World Cup final, I mentioned the fact that you scored the goal. I think you made, was it 3-0 you made it, yeah. right? D did you feel like that was just a blessing from God in that moment? Because you, I'm assuming you already knew in your mind, this is going to be my last game. That wasn't a decision that came after it. You had made it before, is that right? Yeah, I knew I had to make the decision before because if we lost, there's no chance that I was retiring. If I hadn't already mm -hmm. like established that. Um, and so I knew I was going to retire. And honestly, like, it was just so heavy on my heart that I was ready to, to retire. It had been like two years of me wrestling. Like, am I ready? What's next? Like, do you have those conversations with Drew? And he's like, and he you was don't like, need to you're play crazy. No or he wanted you to play. Yeah, he's like, you're nuts. I don't know. If you, and he would always say, like, this is not on me. You need to make this decision. I love watching you play. He was always like, very, like. Well, what kind of helped you get to that decision? Um, I don't know, I had the peace about it. And now, looking back, I'm like, because I, I love playing. I love competing. I miss competing so much. If I can compete in anything, I want to compete. Um, but looking back, I feel like maybe I, I knew, my body knew, like, something wasn't quite right. When you look back now at your career, because your list of accolades is crazy, right? World Cup winner, Olympic gold medalist, uh, Hall of Famer, NWSL champ, NWSL MVP. I think when you retired from, from the league, from the NWSL, you were leading all-time scorer, leading all-time assist giver. Mm -hmm. So insane. Do you think had you given more years to the game, your legacy in the game would be different? Or do you think, hey, with those stats, like, I already did it? Yeah, I don't think... I even think of like those stats as my legacy. What do you think of as your legacy? It's like how I treated my teammates and how they viewed me. Mm. Because like, I can say I have a great relationship with all of the women I played with. And I, um, I feel like that meant more to me. It's like, how do I get the best out of my teammates and how do I make them be the best that they could be? Mm -hmm. um, but actually it's, I'm honored and I feel like very blessed that I have those next to my name, but that's never why I played. I always played because I, I was obsessed with the sport. I loved playing, I loved competing, I loved competing with my teammates. Mm. And I think that's another thing about retirement. You literally have like built in, those, those are your people, like you're doing life with them, you're with them all the time. And like outside of sport, you're like, wait, how do I make friends, you know? And so like, those relationships, those, those moments, those times we were on the road together, the way that we lifted each other up, the way that we supported each other, the way that we won, mm. I feel like was also just as important to me. When you were coming into the team, how, was, how tough was it to break into that team? I remember going in and I was like, don't speak unless spoken to. This is like mm -hmm. what I'm telling myself. Just play, don't speak unless spoken to, like do what you're supposed to do. And so I would nap in between double days. And then I think it was like the fifth day and I fainted. Like I was so dehydrated, I passed out. And Kate Markgraf came up to me and she was like, hey, no problem, I, don't worry, I passed out my first camp and I didn't call, get called back in for four years. And I was like, oh, <laughs> damn. Oh my gosh, like, I can't believe it. But it, I think she was trying to make a joke. Yeah. Um, Kate and I are still really good friends, but I feel like just how the national team was then, it was like a hierarchy. There's a standard that was put there before, 
that just has never left. And it's like, this is what is expected. And, and if you don't show up that way, like, then you're not, you don't belong here. And, and I do love that, that standard and that, that um, just like the expectation to be great all the time um, is, is there because I think that's why we are so good. I feel emotion every time I watch. I feel emotion every time I watch soccer. I don't know if you guys do, but like there is something inside me when I watch any, any game that is like, even like when I watch a kid's game, I'm, I have judgments and thoughts oh, that yeah. I'm like, oh my gosh. I probably have more it, emotions watching kids play. My yeah, kids like play. calm it down, relax. Yeah. Um, but the US Women's National Team were in transition. There are things happening. I think that there is a lot that they have to figure out. I think there is a lot that the NWSL has been through. I think there's a lot uh, that women's sports in general is going through right now. Um, and at the same time, other countries are catching up. And I Their think that we should better. celebrate that. that I, I, we are, I mean. Yeah, like, but it, I think But it makes it more difficult, right? It does. Not that it wasn't difficult before, but the, the bar has gotten higher across the whole board now. Yeah, which I think will propel us to even more greatness. I think that them catching up is going to propel us to more greatness. I think we have some things to figure out. And, and you know what? I watch, and there's, like, critique of older players that played, and they have critiques. And, like, I also think that's fair. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think that's okay. There is a level of greatness that is expected from the U.S. Women's National Team, and everyone's going to have their own feelings on it. And I think that's fair. But the girls who are playing, they're the ones that have to figure it out, and they will. And I do believe that. And I believe that what we have left and what we have created and who created it before us, it will continue. And I do believe that. What, what do you think are the things that have changed? Because you said, yeah, there are, there are things that have changed, right? What, what do you think those are? Yeah, so what I think has changed the most is like the, the media. I think more coverage, the, the more coverage. I think like the women are celebrities. The, so more ups and downs, more b being celebrated, but also more being criticized. Yeah, I love that people know their household names. Like I love that people know Kristen Press. I love that there are young girls coming in. Like I love it. I think that that's great, but there is going to be criticism and they are going to be in the spotlight and we are going to say like, oh, the women's national team has lost it or whatever and they're going to prove you all wrong. So <laughs> I'm excited for it. <laughs>
The bad news is you have like a very large brain tumor. Oh my God. How, what size? Um, when they removed the tumor from my head, it was the size of a billiard ball. Wow. Yeah. And so um, when you hear brain tumor, I, I don't know how you guys would react. I think like death sentence. Like yeah. I thought immediately like cancer, I thought. Um, and so I went to the doctor. They told me they didn't think it was cancer. It was a, something called a meningioma. They weren't 100%, but that was what they were guessing. 32 weeks, my OBGYN was like, you look really bad. And I did. My face was like fully drooping. I couldn't walk straight. Like someone would have to hold my hand if I was walking or like I would just veer off the path over here. Sorry, uh -huh. so can I ask something? You consciously wanted to make sure I, I want to go full time in pregnancy. Like yes. having surgery before I've given birth is not like an option. That was not me. an option. I wanted to make sure that my daughter was okay. And to be fair, my neurosurgeon was like in line with that. Get to 34 weeks, 35 weeks, and and then four weeks later, you'll have brain surgery. And, and what were the risks for you personally during that time? You said obviously you were getting worse, right? What, yeah. what did they lay out for you as potential outcomes? Yeah, not great. Um, so I would go to the doctor and they would talk about like, this could happen, this could happen, this could happen. The, the problem with my tumor was 10 out of 12 of my cranial nerves were inside the tumor. So why my eye doesn't work anymore, why my ear doesn't work, is because those two nerves were in the center of my tumor. So not only were they being damaged because the tumor was like squeezing it, mm. um, then trying to remove all of that tumor from those nerves, that also damaged mm -hmm. the nerves. And so that they didn't come back. Um, but you know, like you go in for your, your pre-op and they're like, you know, if she wakes up in a coma, if you know, she has to be intubated if this, 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 and this. And in my mind, Drew's with me and I'm hearing all these things and I'm telling him afterwards, if I die, I want you to do this. And he's like, none of that. I can't, we're I not talking talk about it. Yeah, we're not talking about that. You're gonna be okay and we're gonna get through it. Um, were you guys always on the same page in terms of how you wanted to, to handle this situation? I think it was he let me decide, and then he coped with it the best that he could. Um, and so my one thing, I don't know how your wives were, but I was a little paranoid with my first, so I was like, okay, I had the baby at 35 weeks. She was in the NICU for one week. Um, she came home, she was super healthy. I had to have a C-section under general anesthesia, so three weeks later is when I was gonna have surgery and I was like, she cannot come to the hospital. It is not safe for her there. It's, you know, I don't want her to get sick. In the morning of my surgery, Drew was with me and I could see the fear. I could, I could see like how nervous he was and I was like, JT, our daughter, she, you tell, her, tell him to bring her. And still to this day, he tells me like the best decision I ever made because she calmed everyone in the waiting room. Oh wow. So like, they had somebody because it was like on. joy, like a new right. baby and everything. And um, I had a 10 hour surgery. And when I woke up, my eye was fully crossed and I lost my hearing and the doctor knew that he told he told them that. Um, but I was alive and I've run a marathon since and I'm healthy. I praise God. Yeah. Oh my I gosh. can show up for my kids, for my family. So did it almost feel like your like arm was asleep or that side of your body was asleep? No, I would Just be not like communicating. Yeah, I would be like, ask me again. And they would be like, lift your arms over your head and I would be like, oh. and I'm like, ask me again. No, and they're like, honey, it's not working. Your arm is not gonna go over your head. Yeah. It's gonna take time. You're gonna have to do it. Um, and so I think that being patient was really difficult for me. Did you ever lose hope? No, I never lost hope. I, I think there was a grieving process of this is what I used to be mm -hmm. and now this is my new normal. Once I was through the surgery, I was like, I'm alive, I'm here, I get to show up however I wanna show up in the world. Um, so I think that that was like how I took it. I always wanted to connect with you after the, the fact because obviously you accomplished so much as a player Mm -hmm. You go through something like this, you're like a superwoman. I mean, to, to go through birth and a surgery, to remove a tumor, and all those, those thoughts of like, am I gonna make it? You're in that state of like, trying to be super positive mm -hmm. in a really dark time. When you look back, 
I know you won Olympic golds, you won World Cups, but are you more proud of how you came through that than anything you did on the pitch? Yeah, I think too, like when you have kids, everything that you accomplished, you're like, you just want for them. And like, it, they don't even have to accomplish a, one sixteenth of what you did, but you just want for them to be the best. And I feel like right when I had my daughter, I was like, nothing else mattered. Yeah, they're happy and healthy and have the like, ability to chase She's alive and she's well, and she's brought so much joy into this world. And it's like, it doesn't, like you said, nothing else mattered in that moment. Um, and now when I look back and I, I think about what we've been through, I'm like, I just hope she knows she's such a miracle and like she saved mommy's life, you know? And I tell her that and she's like, oh yeah, whatever. <laughs> but I'm like, but Why'd you, you say did. that? Why'd you say she saved your life? They told me I probably had the tumor since I was like three and that oh, wow. it only came out in pregnancy because it had a hormone receptor. And so I always tell her, like, not only did she save my life because of that, but like, without the hope of her, I don't know how I would have gone through mm -hmm. it. Because every day was like so easy because I knew I was, what I was doing it for. It was like, there's no way the hope of soccer or winning a championship, as much as I love to win, would have been the same as me living for my child. Mm -hmm. And not only living, like I wanted to live, like I wanted to thrive, I wanted to experience life with her. And so that was what kept me going. There was a piece, did you write a piece, was it in the, the Players Tribune? where you talked about um, an incident that happened with you and Drew, where they, the police tried to put cuffs on him. They did and, cuff him. They did cuff him, okay. And just kind of like how that changed your awareness or your perception of like the different realities that he is an African American and you as a white person were kind of living in this same world, right? Yes, his sister and I went to the gym at like 8 a.m. I did not bring my wallet, she did not bring her wallet. And we drove there, we had just gotten a new car and the license plate was like in the back. It wasn't on yet. It was the paper mm -hmm. license plate. And we were driving, was not speeding, nothing. And a police car was in front of me. He slowed down and he came behind me. And immediately it turned on his lights, sirens. We pull over into an empty area. But like when I looked at my sister-in-law, there were already tears rolling down her face. and. She, w she was like immediately calling FaceTime like t to my husband and her dad and mom like at our, that was five minutes away at our house. And like I realized in that moment that I did not feel the same fear. fear. Mm. And I was like, I knew that there was always a difference. But in that moment, I, I felt her fear. I mm -hmm. felt like that she w felt so unsafe and I didn't have that. And I didn't have that initial reaction and I feel like that's what really like broke me that the, the this is what my family they're my family mm. my husband that's what they're experiencing every time um and I I don't have that initial reaction and mm -hmm. how like unfair that is why'd the police pull you over if you weren't speeding they didn't tell me um they were yelling through a, a megaphone for me to get out of the car but I'm deaf, and so really loud noises, I can only hear like the loudest noise, and so all I could hear was the static. Um, and so he finally came to my window, tells me to get out, and then he like was making fun of me. He was like, oh, you're deaf? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Oh, And um, my sister-in-law is getting more upset because she's like, stop making fun of her. Like, she just had brain surgery, like, whatever. And I'm like, you don't have to defend me. And so it, it escalated quickly, and he never told me what he pulled me over for. But when he asked me who owns the car, I said, I think it's under Drew and Lauren Holiday, and he's like, what does that mean to me? And so he, I knew he knew, but he was like, you don't have your license, and my sister-in-law had already called my husband, so he was on our way, literally five minutes from home. He was on our way with with our license and right when he pulled up, he wasn't like on the scene, they handcuffed him and put him on the side of the road. Yeah. For what reason? They didn't say, they said they, he was interfering with uh, 
a traffic stop. But he didn't, he wasn't, he didn't, hadn't even like right. done anything. Um, and so he was in full Pelican's gear, sitting on, handcuffed on the side of the road. Do you feel differently now in your interactions with police? Because you said, I didn't have that initial fear because, you know, I didn't grow up having to, having to feel like that about those situations. Does it, do you feel differently now? Is it stuck with you? It's interesting because I think my daughter was young at the time. She was, I think she was three. Um, and she, she wasn't a part of it, but I think she heard about it. Like, I think she overheard, obviously our house was like very somber when we got home from that um, incident. And so my daughter has like a, she, every time there's a police officer, I feel like she's pretty uncomfortable. And yeah. so really like Drew and I tried to have her experience people in a way that is positive. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, there is a reality. This is how you can be viewed, but also like there are good people. And so how do we find that balance? Because the last thing we would ever want her to do is react on emotion mm -hmm. for something and, and heaven forbid something terrible happened to her. Because as black Americans, they cannot react on emotion in front of police officers historically in America. So um, that balance is like a really fine balance and a really scary one. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't, I can't even imagine what it's like for black people in America to feel that every single time that they interact that way. Did you ever feel growing up that there was like a, an extent to which your mom, for example, couldn't relate to what your experience was? No, but she understood. I remember the first time I encountered racism, I was probably six or first grade. Um, and, and someone had called me the N-word. Just out in, in playing. And then in, in a game, youth games, I had been called the N-word. So, you know, every time I, I got really upset. And my mom would just say, some people just don't understand. Even in her own family, marrying someone who had been born and raised in Africa, who was very dark and her whole family's Irish, there was already some uncomfortable conversations and feelings in that setting. I kind of was born into it, but I knew like my identity is I'm half white and I'm half black, but everyone sees me as a black individual. But I always felt comfortable in any setting. I felt mm. like that's what separated me because I had both of those perspectives in my household. And in the end, I knew that my mother just loved me so much and cared for me so much that it didn't matter what other people thought or felt and that she just said, you always have your family. So that's what I'm always grateful for. Do you, do you feel like you have to have different conversations with your son to your daughter? Mm. Yes and no. I feel like in, in life, there's different conversations right. with son and daughter. So, so yes and no. Um, I think my daughter is way more sensitive to it. I think she's way more aware. Um, she's always, she's very proud of her curly hair and she loves getting braids and like her, and putting like color in her hair. And, and she is very close to like both sides of the family. But one time she told my parents, she was like, do you guys want to know something weird? And they're like, sure. And she was like, you guys are all white. And me and my brother were black. <laughs> and she said it just so matter of fact. And my mom was like, yeah, and we love that. We love, we love like that you're black. And she was like, okay. My, my kids always draw themselves when they like dark black. <laughs> all, all of them like, you're not that dark. You're, you're, you're light. <laughs> and they always draw themselves black. <laughs> oh, we always die. They do self portraits. They're always dark, darker than me. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, who's this? <laughs> I'm a diehard Celtics fan, uh -huh. and, and Patriots, and all Boston sports teams. But when I look at the Celtics team, she's not team, gonna give you tickets, bro. Chill. Out. No, I already offered. Yeah, <laughs> so, like, uh, it, it felt like they were missing a piece, right? Mm -hmm. And it seems like to me, like they get Drew because of his experience winning the Bucks, and he's an awesome player, right? Yeah. Do you think that's the difference to get them over the hump? 
Yeah, that's interesting. And, you know, obviously it's my husband's job, so I'll, I'll tread lightly. But, uh, like, you guys know as athletes, there are winners and losers in sport. Like, what you can see someone who's phenomenally talented and you're like, but are you a winner? You know, you know they might not have winning qualities. Um, and I think that that's very true in the NBA. They're like really, really talented guys who you're like, mm, they're probably not going to win on their own or, or whatever. I think the Celtics team is so interesting because they are so young. Um, they've had a ton of success for the last however many years. And I think that's the question is, can they get over that hump of like putting team first over individual like success. accolades mm -hmm. and success? And I would say I've seen a significant change throughout the season. So from the beginning to now, it does seem like they're trending in that direction. But like, you never know. They have a young coach who, he actually loves soccer. So I think that he likes to watch the game and, and like some of his coaching, he's like very intrigued with how, how soccer players understand the game, um, which I think is interesting. But we had dinner with him the other night and he asked my opinion and I saw my husband's face and I was like, oh, maybe I should. Like, I was like, maybe I should. Did you have a glass of wine or not? <laughs> I might get too real. That was the coach that met Pep that talked publicly about Pep Guardiola. Sorry, I'm so bad at basketball yes. and stuff, right? That's yes. the one that said, I think Pep is like the best coach in all sports. Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah, he loves, he loves uh, for All-Star break, he went and watched a game at Manchester. So he's, he's invested. He knows the game well, like. Yeah. Like he'll talk with you about like game teams and get tactics. Yeah, he, yeah, he like had soccer tennis set up in the living room when we went over. Oh, I was wow. like, okay, yeah, he's committed. I saw you turning around before when that phone was going off. Yeah, it, it was Lauren's phone, just so you know. It's probably Drew. It, yeah, apparently production said it says my heart. So oh, that's what it's great. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say the only thing that overrides the silent is Drew if he calls twice. Let's so go. You guys should oh, probably tell them. Somebody can override silent. You, it's like a setting, I think, oh, okay, until cool. like if he calls. But and you he's guys got those privileges. Tell him. Stop calling. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're going to let you go anyway because you've given us so much time. But thank you so much for coming through. We really appreciate you. Yeah, no. And so thank you. Like, I don't know how to say to you just how much respect I have for you for what you did in the game, for how you've handled life outside the game, for like the dignity with which you carry yourself in all those areas and, and, and what you are giving back to the community and how you're impacting the communities that you live in. Like, it, it's. It's very impressive. It's very inspiring. And we appreciate you giving us time today. Yeah, Thank I'm proud you. to know you. Thank you. Thank Amen. You. Thank Let's you. Let's go. Do you guys need a fourth? Like, am I, are you guys inviting me <laughs> come in? On. Come oh, on. Mo doesn't hey. come for one show. Come on. Oh, See, yes, you know. Hug. We did launch a network. Can I give you a hug? <laughs> <laughs> we appreciate you. Good to see you. Thank you for coming. Thank you.